if someone were to have a, to approach me at a conference like this and and say, you know, I'm I'm brand new to this thing, I do. Um, if you could recommend just one haiku poet that I should become acquainted with and whose work I should study so I can better understand this thing and its potential. Without an instant's hesitation, I would say Peggy Willis Miles. And so as it happens, I was approached a few months ago um, to talk here at this conference about Peggy. Uh, almost as a tribute to Peggy. Hey, so, again, without hesitation, I said I'd be delighted to uh, and honored to. And so that's what I'm here to do today. And um, the focus of this will be mostly on Peggy's work. And I think that we have a lot uh, of enjoyment to derive from it and a lot to learn from it. Uh, but let me begin with just a few biographical details. Um, Peggy was born in 1939 in, I believe it was Somerville, uh, uh, South Carolina, which is in the low country area in the vicinity of, of Charleston. Uh, she, uh, and, and, and she, uh, throughout her lifetime, uh, returned to the low country for inspiration. You can sense it in many of her poems and for solace. Uh, she graduated from Columbia College, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, with distinction, and uh, she received her master's degree in English from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, and there she was a Woodrow Wilson scholar. Um, for a spell, she taught at the high school and, uh, and university levels. Um, first uh, still in Louisiana, then here uh, in North Carolina, and um, eventually in Georgia, where uh, she and her husband Bill settled and, uh, and raised their family. Uh, so, so Peggy was very much a daughter of the South, and it's, it, there's something fitting that here uh, at H&A, as, uh, as it returns once again to the South, that we that we recognize and, and, and celebrate uh, what I consider to be Peggy Miles' monumental contribution to English language haiku. Uh, Peggy's haiku path uh, began uh, in earnest, I would say. She was acquainted with haiku, but it began in earnest in 1976 when um, in the University of Georgia bookstore, and I think she was teaching at that time there in the English department, uh, she encountered the first edition, the 1974 edition of Cor van den Hubel's The Haiku Anthology. Uh, and um, she's quoted as having said that after that point she was permanently devoted to haiku. Um, I actually visited Core a few days ago, and I and I mentioned this fact, and he was uh, he wasn't aware of that 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 was a trigger for her. So uh, uh, he was surprised and obviously delighted. Um, as it happens, uh, the next two editions of Core's anthology in 1986 and 99, Peggy was present in those volumes, uh, and for the. Uh, from the time that she read Gore's <coughs> anthology for the next 35 years, she was a regular and, and I would say, welcome uh, fixture in all of the um, you know, best uh, English language haiku journals. She was a regular um, uh, in, in all of the haiku contests at the time. And, and I think one area where um, she was especially distinguished was that with some fairly great regularity she was a best of issue winner in a number of journals and just as an example uh, she was a winner of the 
Museum of Haiku Literature Award, award which um, in this country is bestowed by Frogpon four times, which I think is a record. I believe Leonard Moore may have won it three times. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is close. Um, and in, uh, in 2001, uh, Peggy uh, was um, voted by her fellow readers uh, the Poet of the Year for the Heron's Nest uh, Journal. And, uh, and the next year, uh, she was invited to join that journal as one of the associate editors. And I had the privilege when I was starting out uh, with Haiku to have Peggy uh, uh, for a spell as one of my assigned editors. Um, wonderful experience. Um, and I, I'm sure that a number of others in this room um, may have also had Peggy uh, as their editor. And, and uh, uh, there were dozens, and, and, and we're all the more fortunate for it. Um, I, after, uh, after I was reassigned uh, to, to another editor, um, uh, nonetheless I had some periodic email contact with, uh, with Peggy, um, always very cordial, all uh, illuminating, uh, and, uh, and I actually met her in person for um, just very briefly at one of these conferences, the H&A in, in Manhattan in, in New York, I think it was around 2005, and, uh, and I just went up to her, uh, I introduced myself and I thanked her. Um, and that was the one and only time, regrettably, that I met her face to face, but I still feel very much that, that she has uh, was helpful and continues to be an inspiration. Um, but of course there were other people who knew Peggy much better um, in the haiku world. And I want to just spend a few moments to share some of their um, recollections and insights about her because I think that who Peggy was as a person very much informed uh, who Peggy was as a poet. Um, uh, in the Heron's Nest, the, the first managing editor uh, and the founder, in fact, was Christopher Harold. And when I reached out to him, among the things that he said was this. Something I remember vividly about Peggy was her equanimity. There came times in the editorial team's process of evaluating submitted haiku that disagreements arose. Not often, and never threatening the depth of the friendship and respect we felt for one another, but those differences were, nevertheless, somewhat frustrating at times. It was as if we were all a bit out of focus. Peggy would invariably observe such a discussion for a while, then step in to resolve difficulty with almost as few words as she used to write a haiku. She would simply twist the knob slightly and poof, problem dissolved, clarity regained. She was masterful at maintaining equilibrium. Uh, this from Ferris Gilly, who uh, a longtime uh, editor with uh, the Heron's Nest and a, and a fellow associate editor with, with uh, Peggy during the entirety of Peggy's ten, uh, tenure with the journal. In the early days of the Heron's Nest, we editors often shared thoughts among ourselves regarding how best to reply to poets' queries. Haiku editors at times receive submissions that are not remotely akin to haiku. <laughs> I once gently replied to a submitter that the Harris Nest publishes only haiku. And boy, did I get an indignant earful back. <laughs> How dare I suggest that his poems were not haiku? Peggy advised me for the next similar submission to simply reply that the editors hope the author will read several issues of The Heron's Nest and try again if he likes what he finds there. The mistress of diplomacy, that was Peggy. Our current editor, I see in the audience, 
uh, is John Stevenson. And when I reached out to John, this is part of what he had to say. So many things come to mind that I might comment upon in regard to Peggy. Perhaps at the top of the list is the case, is the ease, I should say, gracefulness with which she moved from being my editor at the Heron's Nest to being one of the people I worked with there when I suddenly became the managing editor. Everyone was supportive and professional, but nonetheless, the fact that I was not Christopher Harold required adjustments on everyone's part in the first years of my editorship. Peggy's grasp of my intentions as managing editor and her ability to translate them for some of the other editors was a delightful surprise to me and a skill for which I am still grateful to her. Uh, so we just have a, a bit of thumbnail bio, uh, some personal testimonials from people uh, that knew her best in this realm. But I think that our best sense of Peggy uh, can be gleaned from her work itself. Um, and in uh, just a, a fabulous book uh, that was published by Brooks Books in 2002, um, Peggy had, had this to say in an equally fabulous author's preface, preface which I recommend to everybody. Um, but she, she identified haiku as, quote, these pieces of the story of my life. And elsewhere in the same piece, she went on to say, I want you to read them with assurance of their essential honesty. And uh, so the poems that I'm going to show you in the balance of my talk um, derive from two sources. Um, about a quarter to a third of them were from this volume, which uh, included many of uh, Peggy's best haiku up to the time of its publication in 2002. And um, by the way, I consider this book to be one of the my five top favorite individual poet collections. Um, the remaining poems that I'll be showing you, um, I um, uh, I was fortunate to. Uh, have access. I, I asked Charlie Trumbull if he could uh, delve into his his indispensable haiku database, mm -hmm. and uh, if he would be kind enough to provide me all of Peggy's poems that had been published subsequent to 2002 and, and up to the time of her passing in 2010, uh, and there and he sent me um, uh, a file of uh, almost 400. And, and so the balance of what you, would, you see will be um, in there. Uh, you heard from Christopher about equanimity. You heard from Ferris about diplomacy. You heard from John about gracefulness. These, um, these are all qualities that very much inform Peggy the poet. And when I was first approached to talk about her, the word that came to my mind instantaneously was grace. And, and hence the, the title of this talk, um, The Enduring and Amazing Grace of Peggy Willis Lyle's Haiku. And after I sort of thought about this word for several weeks, uh, it occurred to me maybe I should actually look it up and, and see how um, it's defined. Online I found this. Uh, two parts, although I break them into three. Simple elegance or refinement of movement and courteous goodwill. Uh, so I'd like to address each of these, what I consider three pieces. Simple elegance, refinement of movement, and courteous goodwill, and, and show how I see Peggy's work exemplifying each of those characteristics. Um, simple elegance, I think that so many of Peggy's poems achieve this in, 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 in myriad ways, but one of the ways is that better than anybody else, Peggy could 
juxtapose images that speak to an underlying unity. It sounds paradoxical, but juxtapose images, but you come away with a sense of completeness and, and, and unity. Um, many of these are very visual. In the course of my research on Peggy, I found that she was a painter, uh, in addition to all of her other abundant talents. And, and so you can see in many of these um, what an eye she had. The sparrow's beak, slightly parted, New Year's Day. You'll see in a number of these examples, you have a microcosm and a macrocosm, and they just, they, they gel so beautifully. Ships cross the horizon, a bivalve's hinge. I don't know how many of you are, I, I was a commercial clam digger between summers and college, so I'm familiar with what a bivalve is, but a, a, a bivalve is just a, a, it's a, it's a um, shellfish that, that, that has a hinge, and then like a, a, a clam or a scallop or, or, or a, a mussel. And so, you know, maybe uh, you, you could easily imagine a scene like this. She's, she's along the water, maybe she's got razor clam has washed up on the beach. But you have this concordance, this, this, this fabulous unity. A bluebird with its head turned back, pale evening sky. A few bees left in the clover after club. <coughs> These seem so natural, so effortless. You know, there's an Italian term, sprezzatura, <coughs> effortless genius. This is, it's not effortless, but, but it looks at, as any master will attain something that just seems so A ghost crab takes a turtle hatching, moon drenched waves. I mean, this for me has this wonderful emotional balance. This, um, you know, you have, you know, this is life, but one creature consuming, snatching another. And then moon, so often associated with death. Um, and then you have a human presence. Most of these are predominantly nature, nature. Um, a cold cup from a cold cupboard. Morning sun. Just think of the unity of physical sensation, visual image. Stunning. <laughs> Colored leaves. The flagman twirls his sign to go. Three turns of the pepper mill. Autumn, not at all. Who puts those things together? <laughs> Magnolia's opening. The moon. A wonderful hinge there in the second line, the word opening. Again, you have just this amazing unity. Lovers still, a falling petal catches moonlight. So one of the things I love about this poem is just think about how the role of the petals transitions from line two to line three. In line two it's falling, in line three it's catching. And then think about how that relates to human relationships. These poems withstand, encourage, and reward scrutiny. And then uh, this concordance you often see 
in the seasons of nature juxtaposed with the seasons of our lives. So the next six talk to that. Spring something, the baby's toes spread apart. And those muscular rays, it, it's, it's, it's a dawning of, of, of the day, the season, the year, and life. Spring breeze, a boy with a whistle, and just the nothing. <laughs> Bird song through open windows. He lifts the veil. Aperitifs. The sunflower's shadow reaches her silk blouse. There you see the artist's eye. And elsewhere. A hiker with his head down, yellow leaves. And finally for the, this set, wild persimmons. A woman at the roadside wiggles her last tooth. Um, I, I, and persimmons, I believe, is a season where the key go. Uh, for it's a winter, you know, and, 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 and if I'm not mistaken. Autumn. I'm sorry? Autumn. 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 Okay. So we're approaching. <laughs> uh, but a, and, and, and uh, the tooth isn't totally out, I guess. Um, I, I, and, and simple elegance can also take the form of choosing just the right word. And I think that this next poem, for me, exemplifies that. Early darkness, friends pool the words to an old song. They're not singing the words to an old song. They pool the words to an old song. What that says about community, you know, uh, 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 about you know, the, the, the closeness of these people, I, it, you know, transcends the word, but but is is that is your passage way. So back to our definition, the the second aspect of uh, that I'd like to speak to of grace is this refinement of the movement. And and when I think about Peggy's work, um, what it conjures up for me is, is a fairly well-known passage. Uh, uh, Michael mentioned Alexander Pope in the opening comments, and uh, there is a fairly well-known passage from uh, what's called an essay on criticism, which is basically a long poem on uh, addressing the, the craft of, of poetry. Um, but, but this line, uh, this, this stands up. True ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest who learn to dance. Tis not enough, no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. You know, Peggy was steeped in British and, and, and American literature, I mean, an extremely learned person. Uh, I have little doubt that she was familiar with this quote, but even if uh, she wasn't in the, in the same author's preface of, of To Hear the Rain that I mentioned earlier, um, she dispels all doubt and she says, quote, sound enhances meaning. Every nuance contributes to its total effect, unquote. And, um, in, she had an artist's eye. In my estimation, Peggy had the best ear in English language haiku of anyone up to and through the time of her life. And uh, um, 
And, and one of the one of the things that you can do this for yourself. You may have noticed that I was really reading those first sets of poems slowly. And and in the same preface, she says, "How would I have you read my poems?" And her first thing she says, "Slowly." Um, and I guarantee you that if um, if you can read a poem slowly and it sounds good, then then you may have a keeper there. Because haiku that, uh, that don't attend properly to their sound, they tend to fall apart when they're read slowly. A damp fern strokes my ankle. Dark eyes of the doe. This is a, I mean, sound rhythm sound play. This, um, this is a tapestry of sound and it, and it creates this unified effect uh, that, that enhances the meaning. I'm not going to do this with all the poems that you'll see, but if we were to um, delve into this a little bit, um, we have assonance, damp, ankle. We have assonance again, Strokes, doe, once again, my eyes. We have alliteration, damp, dark, doe. You can do the same thing with K, strokes, angle, dark. Um, but it works. It, it, isn't, it isn't so intrusive that it distracts, it enhances, it reinforces. <coughs> Sultry afternoon, a wide tooth comb glides through wet hair. I defy you to read that second line quickly. You can't. And 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 it's and it enhances, it is the wide tooth comb glide. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. The gentler way the wind moves maiden hair. Supple reeds, the river mingles with the sea. The turning tide at standstill, stand hill frames. A one liner, but it has that natural break right between standstill and sandhill. That's where the tide turns. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. This next one I, I, um, I selected for the um, uh, High Blue Society of America Members Anthology in 2010. Wax myrtle, full of red song, sweet sea wind. Oak saplings from a nurse log, leaves becoming loam. Here we have the circle of nature, but look what the poem's doing. Oak saplings, oh it, at the end, becoming loam. Oh it, it, oh. We've got it all comes around. But this is this is some <laughs> alchemy, phonic alchemy that 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 she had. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. Rain settles some of the pollen, some of the plants. Crowded mall. Water magnifies a goldfish in a plastic bag. Think about the amount of time it takes to say lines one and three as opposed to line two. Water magnifies a goldfish. I mean, it, it, it's just expanding before your eye or ear. Um, again, the sound must seem an echo to the sense. 
perhaps my favorite Peggy poem, Snowed In, the wedding ring quilt, lumpy with children. I mean, besides the imagery, besides the sound, what this says about family. I mean, this is literature. I, I mean, you, you, I, you couldn't do more in more words than what this conveys in my estimation. And then I began with the Alexander Pope stanza referencing as a metaphor dance. Well, uh, Peggy was very cultured, literature, art, also dance. It's not surprising that she wrote several haiku with that as, as a, a touch point. A new year, slippers in first position on the white tile floor. <laughs> She strikes the pose of Degas, Degas's little dancer, sunlight through green leaves. At last, a slow dance, fireflies. Before moving on to the third aspect of grace, um, I do want to mention one and show one last poem which I think speaks to this sound quality. Cedar shavings. The carpenter's magnet snaps up tacks. Snaps up tacks. That wonderful assonance of the as and, and again the sound must seem an echo to the sense. So let's move to the third element, courteous goodwill. Um, I think that there, again, is so much in Peggy's poetry um, that reflects the quality of the person, perhaps as you got a sense through comments that Christopher Ferris and John um, shared with me and, and I'm sharing in turn with you. Uh, and and, and um, it, it strikes me that one of the hallmarks of courteous goodwill is humor. So many haiku of Peggy Lyles um, are just infused with this gentle humor. And, um, you know, and what's behind humor but a sense of perspective. You know, if you can, if you can, if you can, um, see the joy, the humor in things. Um, it, 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 um, it restores some of that equanimity that, that Christopher was talking about. Um, and, 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 and it also provides evidence that this person can see the big picture, whatever the tribulations of the moment might be, that there, there's, there's, there's a broader perspective to be had. Um, so let me share a few uh, poems that I think are in that vein. Midsummer, the poet passes a hat full of figs. I mean, in this community, I like to think we're not all takers, we're, we also give. But you have that wonderful turn between lines two and three as people are conditioned to think about starving poets. Um, not surprised when he mentions his mother, light spring rain. Sometimes daughter and mother-in-law relation, this may come as news to you, but sometimes daughter and mother-in-law relationships are vexed. But what a, what a, what a nice way of kind of dealing with Honeysuckle taking down the spike fence. This works a couple of ways. It's wonderful. They, um, they both, the two ways that come to mind for me, they both work equally well on a physical level, but also sort of the metaphorical level. First, 
warm day, two gloves left for gardening. I'm sorry, two left gloves. Forgive my dyslexia. Two left gloves for gardening. It works better that way, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> See, I still have things to learn from me. For her mother, bluets, roots and all. Bluets, bluets. Um, again, in, in just this little vignette, what that says about family. Iced in, the puppet show slowed by a knot. <laughs> Traffic jam. My small son asks, who made God? Peggy uh, said at another point in, in the author's preface to, uh, to Hear the Rain, Quote, for years I have thought of English language haiku as literature poets are creating together. Unquote. And so often now, as, as not only a writer of haiku but an editor, uh, I, 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 I almost can't stop myself from reading one poem and sometimes thinking of another poem. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's one of this. That's part of this wonderful tapestry. This this, this collective literature that that um, Peggy was talking about. And 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 when I see this poem, I can't help but think of a, a wonderful poem that was written just within the last year or two by someone who happens to be in this audience. And I haven't gotten permission to share this, but I will. And and um, uh, and I think. Uh, it is in much the same spirit, but the um, but the interrogation is 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 working in a different direction. Or is up. Dad asks what I know about girls <laughs> by Joe McKean, and and so I think that that you know the, these are these are poets um, drinking from the same wellspring of, of creativity and, and brilliance, and and they 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 both. For me, you know, this confined space and, okay, how do we deal with these awkward things? Another Peggy poem. The first notes squeezed from bagpipes, small town parade. And again, the anthologist in me thinks, oh, I have a perfect poem to pair that one with. Um, so by another poet, Parades end, a trombone outside the portal loop. <laughs> and my subtle way of getting in a few parents <laughs> uh, This, I, you know, I mentioned uh, earlier about Peggy's um, poetry having this gentle humor. But I find something, this next poem, I find something um, Deliciously transgressive, um, perversely hysterical. I, you may or may not react, react the same way, but I, I, this kind of tickles me. Years end. We watch the little horn snake eat its weekly mouse. <laughs> Just this notion of a weekly mouse. I, it, it, it does something for me. Uh, another aspect of um, of this cordial. Uh, courteous goodwill um, is, I think, the quality of um, wearing your knowledge or cultural orientation light. Peggy was, from everything I can sense, brilliant, um, and and she was steeped in all kinds of, you know. Um, classical and contemporary culture, be it literature, art, dance, music. There are a number of music I who I haven't touched on here. Um, and, uh, uh, but I think that she could do it with a light touch. And, and a few examples uh, uh, strikes me this way anyway. Um, Drowning with Icarus in the textbook print. 
I mean, we've, we've all studied mythology at some point. There's, of course, the famous um, Ovid story, Icarus, son of Daedalus, uh, you know, has the, uh, has the feathers that are stuck on with wax. He gets too close to the sun, he plunges into the drink. Uh, <laughs> but drowning in words. Um, a different mythology. Osiris <coughs> reconstructed buttercups. Osiris, Egyptian god, um, murdered by his brother Set, chopped up into pieces. Osiris's both wife and sister, I'm not sure how that worked, Isis, um, reconstructed uh, uh, Osiris. But here it ends with buttercups. Uh, this is a poem that I actually read um, earlier, but will segue a little bit into the art world. I mentioned that Peggy painted. Um, uh, in this instance, though, a Degas, but a, a sculpture. Um, she strikes the pose of Degas's little dancer, in case you were wondering, it was not one of his pastels or, or oils, but it was a, uh, a fairly well-known sculpture I, I've um, sunlight through green leaves. Um, I've seen this in the Fog Museum at Harvard, but I, this, this particular image is from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And, uh, and it, maybe it gives you a little bit of better uh, touchstone for the third line there, sunlight through green leaves, if you check out her the skirt. And, uh, and, and uh, Peggy knew her art, uh, evidently. Uh, here's, here's one, spring thunder promising to meet by the Monet. And, uh, and if you think of the Impressionists, most especially the quintessential Impressionist, Claude Monet, you know, his, all of his canvases are light suffused. And um, you know, Peggy lived in, in Georgia. You know, she had uh, met her friend at the High Museum in Atlanta. Perhaps they would have met under this painting. I don't know. But, but that's, that's typical, and there are others that are even more brilliant. And, and, um, uh, another painter, and very much involved with light, but a different kind of light. A coin to light the niche in Caravaggio. Uh, it, uh, for those who may have not had this um, fun experience, if, uh, if you're in, in Europe, and most especially if you're in Italy, uh, there are churches that you can go into uh, where sometimes there will be, you'll see, a, a, a dark painting on a wall, and there will be a little box, and maybe you put in a, a euro, and then magically the painting is illuminated. Then there was light, and 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 um, uh, and and so what for me is it really connects with this poem is that yes, you have this artificial light coming on, but Caravaggio was this baroque master whose use of light was revolutionary and, and um, uh, cinematic, dramatic, and, and, and amazing. So if, if, you, uh, if you're in a, uh, there, there's a particular uh, a church in Rome uh, uh, that has actually three of his canvases, I'll show you one in a moment. Uh, just imagine you see, your, you see this dark area, and then you put the euro in the box, and then you see the calling of St. Matthew. I mean, so you think about, you know, a coin to light the niche, Carvaggio, and that's what you see. <clears throat> um, so you have this wonderful double of illumination. Uh, you know, Peggy was, uh, uh, my very sense was, was very, um, spiritual, religiously devout. There, there is a lot of evidence of her faith in her poems. And, and here too you'll find, um, you'll find a lot of allusions um, to, uh, um, uh, to religious and, and in this instance Christian um, uh, faith. Dust on the pews. Afternoon sun washes the apostles' feet. Again, a here and now perfect replay of, of, a, of a pivotal uh, scene from uh, Christianity. 
dark seed pods rattled the Judas tree. You know, I can, I can almost hear those 40 silver coins, and, 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 I, and, and Judas, of course, uh, Carius uh, hanged himself. Um, and then that's, that, in fact, is what's behind the naming of that tree. And, 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 uh, um, but the poem fills in the rest. And finally, starlight on harp strings, Christmas Eve. Yeah, um, in Sharani's book, uh, uh, he talks about uh, these two axes that haiku can tap into, and, and, and one of the axes, I think, is the vertical axis, can tap into um, collective and cultural <coughs> memory. And so these, these examples from the world of art, literature, religion, this, this, this is tapping into something that many of us, at least in this, in this, uh, in this culture, share, and, and it just further adds to the resonance of, 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 of those things echoing things that we're still experiencing here and now in the present moment as, as uh, enacted in the haiku. Uh, and then in a more modern allusion, uh, in what I think is a stunning juxtaposition of um, modern American history, in this instance the, the March on Washington, and a Japanese haiku <coughs> classic. We have this summer grasses, a man from Georgia tells his dream. And of course the Basho classic is summer grasses, all that remains of warriors' dreams. But so here you have this amazing convergence. Um, and in my estimation, of course, beautiful. Uh, one um, third and last uh, aspect, maybe, of this courteous goodwill is, um, is what I would call gentle wisdom. I mean, Peggy's poems are first and foremost what they are, what they're written about. What they're ostensibly about is what they're about. But almost always there are overtones and undertones. And, um, and I, at least for one, find personal lessons in um, the set of haiku that, that I'd like to share with you here. 88 temples, or just this be. 88 Temples is a reference to the uh, Shikoku pilgrimage route uh, where devotees or, or uh, aspiring uh, Buddhists will, will, will go to get spiritual nurturance. But maybe just a bit. We'll do. Dickinson all or just to be something like that. Um, Dragonfly, the Tai Chi master, shifts his stance. He's avoiding an insect. But is there something more there that we can derive from this in terms of our own flexibility? <coughs> North Star, we follow Jasmine. Groundbreaking, a clump of weeds flung aside. What's expendable, what isn't expendable, what needs to give way, or just Weeds flung aside. Mm -hmm. It's also that. Sometimes a cigar is just a. Um, in the dark places, first fireflies. That's like a credo for me. I mean, it's it, it, it's a wonderful poem. It's descriptive. It 
also feels like words to define. Uh, this one. A wonderful uh, little vignette, but I find more in it besides. Dog-eared script. I prompt a wise man from the wings. <laughs> With how I've steeped myself delightfully in, in, in Peggy's background and her poetry, I can't help if this is only me sensing from this that I wonder how often Peggy herself was prompting ostensibly wise men in her life from the wings. I imagine it happened more than once. And um, maybe it was an old story, dog-eared script. <laughs> so um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to wrap up with two poems, but before I do so, I'd like to uh, share sort of a personal reaction to this process that I went through. Uh, you know, once I said, "Sure, I'd love to talk about Peggy." Um, I mentioned earlier that. Of course, I went through all the fabulous poems in this book, and I went through another almost 400 other fabulous poems um, that had been published of Peggy's uh, in the years since the book came out up to the time of her passing. And um, <laughs> at a certain point, I was reminded of there, um, some of you may be familiar with this term, but there's this thing called um, the Stendhal syndrome. It's also called the Florence syndrome. And um, the writer Stendhal um, had an experience in, in, the, in the city of Florence. And he was a visitor and, and, um, um, and, and, here is, uh, and he wrote about it and then this expression was coined the Stendhal or the Florence syndrome. And, and it's been defined this way. And, and, and tourists who, who go to Florence uh, every year that this still happens, um, a number of people get hospitalized. Um, and uh, it's called, um, it's a psychosomatic condition involving rapid heartbeat, dizziness, fainting, confusion, and even hallucinations, allegedly occurring when individuals become exposed to objects or phenomena of great beauty. So when, when I was reviewing all these haiku, I was sort of like, wow, wow, this is amazing. And, and um, uh, you know, and, and, and more than once, maybe several dozen times, I, 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 there was an inside voice, I wish I'd written that. And, 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 so, um, and so maybe even in the, the course of the brief time we've spent, we're spending together here, you maybe I can share a little bit of, uh, and maybe you've experienced for yourself a little bit of the same sort of happy delirium. Um, again, I, I, I think that there is a lot to be learned from, uh, from Peggy's poetry. I'd like to conclude with, um, with two very late poems of Peggy's. Uh, the first one, I think, uh, appeared actually after, shortly after she passed away in September of 2010. Um, and I have no idea whether it was conceived of as such, but, but I think for a lot of people it resonated almost, almost as, as a death poem. And here it is, Into the Afterlife, Red Leaves. Um, I don't get to choose, but if I did, I could, and I think that this, uh, like all of her poems, I think it's amazing. Uh, there are others that could stand in equally well for the uh, for the same purpose, if you will. Um, but I'd actually choose the next one. A loud goose toward the moon. I've lived here too. And and I think that haiku does this. It it um, it's our way of bearing witness. It's our way of sharing. These little moments that, you know, for most of us and most of the time we think of as expendable. But, you know, as, as Peggy said in, in, in the preface uh, to her book, you know, these are pieces of the story of our lives. And 
you know, um, and these are things we, we heard this term earlier in this conference. These are things that we want to share with others. And, and one of the beauties, in my estimation, of work by a poet like Peggy Lyles is that um, we come to know her better, truly know her better, not just through knowing her biography, not just through knowing and hearing testimonials from those who are close to her in, in our realm, um, but, um, but, but from the poems themselves, from her poems. And um, as this is a person worth knowing. Um, but beyond that, she does, she does what the really great haiku poets do. And when we read their work, we not only have a better sense and feeling for that person, but we have a better sense of ourselves in the process. Because that person can't connect as a haiku poet without tapping into something that we feel on our own. Um, and so, in my estimation, nobody did that better than Peggy Lyles, and, and so for that, I feel tremendously thankful. Um, so thank you, Peggy, and thank you for listening.